Welcome everyone. Uh, please take a seat. Um, we have Jeff, Jeff Traik with Apache HTTP Server 2.4 Problem Diagnosis. Hello there. Hi, first thing I want to tell you is uh, you might want to, well, you probably want to get a copy of these slides because I have a lot of slides to go through. Um, I'm going to gloss over some of them. Some of them are very simple uh, recipes, right? So the slide won't be on the screen long enough to copy down all the little configuration directives. So I'm going to try to spend more time on the interesting things, but we'll see how that goes. And, uh, you know, if, if you have a question, like a short question that pertains to what we're talking about, you know, walk towards the mic and eventually um, I'll see you. Uh, otherwise, I hope we have uh, more time at the end for uh, more interesting things. Okay? So here are the slides. My name is Jeff Trawick. I've worked on um, HTTPD for about 13 years now. Most of that time I worked for large corporations that had, um, you know, long-term support for this software and, you know, customers that expected help. Um, spent a lot of time on just countless uh, customer problems. So obviously I'm very interested in, in what are the tools and techniques for diagnosing problems. Um, and I've had some um, efforts to kind of extend, you know, kind of stretch out what the diagnostic, the inbuilt diagnostic capabilities are. So we'll look at some of these um, projects or experiments later in the talk. And, and a lot of things we're going to talk about um, are just basic uh, 2.4 capabilities out of the box. And um, I'm really not going to <laughs> spend a lot of time on some of these boring slides, but right, we're, you know, problem symptoms, right? Crashes, the server hangs, or certain requests hang, um, things terminate abruptly, bad response time, high resource consumption, um, bad output. You know, these are all the kind of things that uh, make you want to look at, look at logs, look inside the server, etc. Uh, also, non-problems, right? You have a new application or a new web server setup you've deployed. Uh, you know, run through your normal um, user regression test and see at different log levels. See what the logs look like when everything is supposedly working properly. Then when you do have a, uh, one of those unfortunate weekend things, and you see something in the log, go back to your you know, logs you've saved from a good run and see if they're there in the same frequency or order or whatever, right? So looking inside the server or looking at logs it creates is a good thing, um, even in a good situation, to understand what it is you've deployed. Um, let's see. Uh, something uh, to be really aware of with the logging uh, is what kind of information gets logged as you turn up the trace level, as you use additional, to, you know, non-standard log files. Um, in particular, we have passwords and session keys and, and a lot of other confidential information that could be stored in the log files, right? So, you know, depending on your access to the logs, your retention policies for the logs, and, you know, part of retention is is who gets access to it somewhere else once it's offline from the web server, right? This could cause huge problems and you may get into a situation where you have to tell all your users to change their passwords because a period of time elapsed after which you realize that these critical information or private information had been available to a number of people that you can't really count or name. So uh, mod dump IO, I mean, just about always, it's going to potentially log uh, private data. Modlog config can be configured to do that. Uh, Modlog forensic, you know, basic HTTPD when you turn up the log levels. And we'll look at some of the cases where that can appear. Okay, uh, maybe you got to see uh, Rich's talk yesterday about new 2.4 features. Uh, one of the great things is that error log is configurable. Um, modules can implement their own uh, fields in the error log and, you know, when information is not available for a certain field, uh, that field can be dropped altogether. You know, so here is a typical message. We have a timestamp with sub-second uh, accuracy or precision, I should say. Uh, we're supposed to have the module ID where you see that hyphen colon error. Um, that's actually mod WSGI. Um, and, you know, PID, thread ID, et cetera. 
And some of this, if you look at the mod WSGI portion of the message, that's stuff that it had explicit code to add, you know, basically for working with older versions of Apache, right? It has its module name, even though that should appear in a trace field. It, it puts the PID in there, even though that appears automatically, right? So over time, we'll see that just like the core bundled, the bundled modules, right, these third-party modules will be updated to better utilize the new air log capabilities, not duplicate information and so forth. Now here's a little trick. Um, we probably saw something similar to this yesterday at Rich's talk. You know, what if you want to log only for the specified client IP, right? So globally we have a log level info and we say um, if the remote address came from some loopback, IPv4 loopback device, then we're going to crank the log level up to trace eight. And, uh, you know, there's a little blurb at the bottom about why it has to appear in a location container. I believe um, Stefan Fritsch fixed that. And uh, I'm not sure if it's in 244 or not, right? But this is, this will work in all the 24 levels. It, it just, you know, it may be a little bit simpler with 244. Um, maybe there's a certain um, URI, a certain portion of the web space that you want to have more detailed login on, some application that you've just de deployed and it's not quite working right, right? We can crank up the trace level to the max just for that, um, you know, just for those requests. Um, also, just the core HTTPD has logging of HTTP data at different layers. Um, you can see, uh, you know, basic summary of the request or headers received from the client, um, the response, uh, headers sent to the client, right, and they have slightly different trace levels. But, you know, log level debug is not gonna show any of these, right? You have to have at least log level trace three for the HTTP module in order to see that. And you need four or five for the other data. So this, this is kind of stuff that you might have needed to um, run a packet trace on with previous levels, right? Because there wasn't a capability to trace all of this data, you know, with a basic server feature. Uh, mod log debug is a new module. It's kind of interesting. Um, you know, normally when we see messages in the error log, right, those messages are baked into the binaries, right? Somebody had to write code to say, um, at this point in my module processing, I want to log um, some summary of what happened, right? But mod log debug gives you some flexibility as an administrator to enable messages, right? So uh, we'll look at a couple of examples of the log message directive, right? So let's say that there's some module and it uses request notes internally to track state or um, some kind of correlator, right? So the administrator can say, I want to log a message that shows that request note. And when do I want to log it? I want to log it basically at every phase of process, request processing. That's what uh, <clears throat> hook equal all means. And furthermore, I can say I want to log it only if that expression is true and that expression checks that, um, you know, that note is actually set. So if the module doesn't handle that request, the note wouldn't be set if uh, the module only sets that at a later phase, then you won't see, you know, the uninteresting lines in the log before then. You know, here's another um, example where, you know, may have your issue with mod include and included resources. Mod include uses something called sub-request to issue those, uh, the request to pull in the embedded documents, right? So you could have a um, log message directive that that prints information about, you know, request a certain resource that was problematic for whatever reason. Or we can um, do, you know, here's a case, I'm not sure exactly why we would want this, but uh, we catch a certain request error code and we're logging some arbitrary information about the request. You know, and remote adder might not be a good example because that's in the access log anyway, but, you know, we could pull out some other aspect of the request that's not logged by default. And, uh, you know, that, that uses the new expression capability in 2.4. So the same variables, same syntax that you could use with um, certain SSL directives and a lot of other stuff. 
Okay, mod dump IO, this has been a while, been around for a while. Um, has a very simple configuration. Uh, put a few directives in there. In 2.4, you'd say, um, I want dump IO to trace at level trace seven. And I wouldn't have to turn up the noise for everything else. And, you know, this is just an example of what you can see. Um, and you see the request, you can see the data sent and received, right? That's that's one thing, like the connection keep alive, the, the request line, the git slash dir. Um, it also, for um, studying the internal flows within HTTPD, right, you can tell a little bit more about the processing, such as what kind of memory structure that was stored in and how many bytes long it is. But this is often used to, to get the line flow above the SSL layer without using a packet trace. And, you know, packet trace with SSL is a pain, right, because you have to have the certificates and all that stuff to um, unencrypt it. Uh, catching requests which do not finish, mod log forensic. Right, so a crash is really the typical case here. Um, a web server child process crashed. Uh, presumably some request was being processed at the time that triggered uh, a bug. Right, so in order to track um, what was going on there, one way with log forensic is, you know, you turn it on, it records a special uh, line in its log at the beginning of the request and another line at the end of the request that says, hey, that other thing is done. Right, so after a crash, if you run this uh, log scanner, check forensic, right, it will find the beginning of the request things that were never ended. And, and you'll see some, you know, maybe it's just one and that's the bad guy. Or maybe you'll see some candidates, a small set of candidates for what request triggered the crash. If you had a, like a threaded child process like event or worker, uh, you know, when one uh, request triggers the crash, right, gets processed by bad code and the child process crashes, you might have four or 40 other requests being processed at the same time by that process. So you might get a lot of candidates here for which one actually uh, caused the crash. Um, tracking where the error message came from, um, this has been, you know, a mystery for a long time. Uh, the, I think the bundled modules with HTTPD were, were pretty, um, pretty good about, well, the thing is, you have the source code for all of those always, right? So you can go search through the cert, uh, search through the source for the text of the message. But sometimes you have third-party code, uh, and you wonder where the message came from. Sometimes you can find the strings and the binaries. Um, other times, you know, they've glued together so many different pieces, it's not trivial to find that way. But uh, we should have um, the module ID for that with 2.4. And, uh, you know, there was more WSGI messages, some that, you know, in the mod WSGI, it included the module ID. Others were its logging um, output from, standard error output from the script, right? It just logged the output and didn't put the ID. But hopefully that'll be, that fix will be included soon. Um, what else? Okay, this is kind of, this is kind of hacky. It's just a, maybe just a, in, the, in the experimental set, but, you know, sometimes you get an error message that's written by utility routine, right? That says, uh, I call a utility and some kind of error happened and here's the message. But you really want to know what the caller of the utility was. So mod backtrace, which is an unbundled module, um, third party module, has the capability of putting the backtrace information in an error log field. And in this case, you know, we have our regular you know, 2.4 error log format directive. And somewhere in that directive, it uses the percent capital B um, format field. And that's for mod backtrace. And in this case, we pass mod backtrace this parameter, you know, AH00128. And that tells it, hey, if, uh, if that string is, which is a HTTPD message ID is in the message, then replace this field with, um, a representation of the backtrace. And of course, if it doesn't appear there, then that field won't even uh, show up in the error log. And unfortunately, this example, uh, I didn't have any symbols available, so you don't see any function names for the backtrace. But um, that could, you know, that could show up better. 
for. Of course, on the other hand, it would show up much longer with actual function names. But that would be a way to track down what module did it, right? Take a map of memory to show which, uh, you know, DSOs were loaded at which address, and there you go, you can find out what offset from a particular module uh, generated the call. Okay, let's see, resource use, um, I mean, we're not gonna talk about this much, uh, just, you know, IOSTAT, VMSTAT, even PS can be told to display a bunch of interesting fields. You know, Windows, you have the Process Explorer that can show IO activity and um, CPU usage and, and stuff like that. Uh, system call traces, S trace trust. Anywhere you have D trace, you have the D trust command, you know, Mac OS, uh, Mac OS 10, um, FreeBSD, Solaris. Okay, some more interesting things. We'll spend a lot more time on this. Uh, looking inside the process with a debugger like GDB or something like PStack on Solaris. Right, so uh, for certain types of problem symptoms, you know, you report that in the Apache bug database, we're gonna say, well, hey, go, you know, use GDB or PStack and get, get some basic information, which is the backtrace to the, to the crashing code. Um, and also DBX, if, if you're on AIX, right, you're probably gonna use DBX for this, same, same basic idea. And the kind of information that's good, um, you know, I think both of these are kind of equivalent for using GDB on most platforms versus using the proc tools on Solaris. You get the backtrace of all the threads, you get um, kind of a listing of all the threads, you see where um, all of the uh, modules are loaded, you know, in the address space. And I think on, um, I think only for the GDB example, we'll also have a little bit of code around the program counter. So sometimes you can tell a bit about the, uh, based looking at the instruction where the, um, where a crash occurred, or otherwise where the instruction where you've called into some system call that's blocking. Okay, so let's see, you know, if we do these commands, what kind of GORP do we get? And I'm gonna um, switch to uh, an editor. Let's see, so this is, this is a Solaris example with a PStack. Right, and it says, hey, we got a thread, here's thread one, and that's its backtrace. And um, assuming it has a certain number of parameters, right, we've got the hex for those parameters and the offset um, from the function entry point, you know, like the plus two six dog or plus three able. And oh, here's another thread, and uh, I mean, if, if you look at these a million times, right, you know that that's a thread that starts up at initialization and then exits, so PStack shows it as a zombie. Now we've got all this boatload of other things, and uh, you know, if you stare at it long enough and you know the code, you say, well, we got, I don't know, 24 idle worker threads doing nothing, and we have um, one thread, I think it's thread nine. Look, here's a, here's a thread that's actually running, you know, supposed to, supposedly generating the response for the request, and it called some code uh, crash handler. <laughs> which called another function with crash in the name. Um, you know, wouldn't it be nice if all the code out there would call the function crash underscore something when it, <laughs> but that's a kind of artificial situation, obviously. Okay, let's see, GDB equivalent. Okay, in this case, I'm running GDB uh, against a core file. I've got, this is from the info shared library message, right? So I see definitively all the, all the system libraries, all the bundled modules, all the third party modules that got loaded into HTTPD and what address range, you know, where they live, right? So that's cool if you, if you have a, just a plain code address for something, you go to that table and you can figure out what, you know, who did something. Uh, what else? Uh, a lot of ugly, uh, a lot of ugly backtraces in here. I've, I've built this HTBD with, um, you know, all the symbols, right? So it can display the names of parameters and the values, and uh, also the local variables. But again, um, I don't know how much output is here. Let's see, 1,700 lines of output, right? And if you stare at it long enough and you know the code, 
you can figure out that um, maybe there's 15 completely idle threads doing nothing and I think there were a smaller set that were waiting for to read the request from clients and there was one uh, I think we can probably search for crash underscore yeah there was one thread in um, in crash request let's see So again, in order to understand that, right, you've got to be able to filter out the kind of normal behavior, right? A, a thread that's just uh, reading something from a client just like it does for every kind of request. A thread that's completely idle and doing nothing, right? Not part of your problem symptom. And also, uh, at, you know, if at all possible, determine definitively where a crash occurred if, you know, if that's what happened. Um, and, you know, this is kind of a, a I don't know if it's a social problem, but, uh, you know, there's a problem with debugging, right, is that you, you, you show it to the right person or the right set of people, right, they know very quickly what all that means, right, but if, if you're a, a user of HTTPD, right, that's collecting this kind of information, you don't even know enough to evaluate whether you got the right data. Right, so like I mentioned here, users typically send in this backtrace that shows the main thread uh, blocked on a pipe, which it's going to be for the next three years if you don't shut down your server, right? That's just not, not useful, right? So it'd be cool to have like a, you know, code that can convert the backtrace to kind of a, a common format, a very simple format, and then have a database of annotations to say what these backtraces mean. Right, and it could be looking at the entire backtrace. It could look at just a few elements in the backtrace. And, um, you know, to identify what the thread is and what it means that it has that um, execution context. So let's see. we I got to go somewhere else now. So here's our um, Solaris 10.core.pstackout that we just looked at in a minute, a minute ago in Emacs, right? But this is a bit of a different view of it. Um, probably the first, the top level thing that it has done is that it, um, it simplified the backtrace here, right? So we say function name and then a symbol and the function name that called it and so forth, right? So this, this is a much more uh, simple representation of what's happening in that thread. Uh, now once we did that, we can do something else that's very important. We say, gosh, we have 24 threads that look the same when you look at them at that level. And then um, we have an annotation here. Hey, we've recognized this backtrace as being the event npm child main thread. And we can also say, what's it doing? It's waiting on the termination event. Or here's another one, an npm child, several of these say npm child worker thread, right? Same here for that thread, but in this case it's waiting for a connection to handle, and in this case, it's running the request handler, right? So just um, have a little database that looks for certain patterns in the backtraces. We can tell, we can identify what that thread is for and hopefully tell something about the state it's in. And then if we really want to, um, you know, look at it at a higher level, or I'm sorry, at a lower level, um, we can um, look at more of the stuff from GDB or PStack or whatever. Now that, that blue doesn't come out very well, but like this case, we have a pstack output, and all we have is one line for the function in the raw data that tells us the, you know, the function arguments. I think if we look at, um, you know, try to do the same thing for this GDB example, right? Let's say, uh, where's the guy that did something bad? I mean, I know it did something bad because I recognize crash request, but you know, I, I'm going to look at all these descriptions of the, of the thread and the state and kind of filter these guys out because they're doing something normal. And here we, hey, hey, we're running the request handler, right? We're busy doing something when something bad happened. Um, let me look at that further and see what's going on. And, and with, the, um, with the GDB example, you know, we had um, local variables available. We have the names of the symbols and they get formatted properly, whether they're a pointer or integer or something. So I think, I think this is um, 
you know, doing something in this direction uh, is a way to ha help, help users help themselves with this kind of data. Uh, they can get a lot of meaning out of it without getting uh, the attention of a developer. And, you know, by, by switching out the database of annotations, right, this could be for traffic server or this could be for some commercial product, right? It's the same basic analysis takes place under the covers that just need different descriptions. Okay, document, okay. Um, there are other things that I'm not really exploring right now, um, like uh, playing with the debuggability of the generated code, right? Uh, what kind of optimization is there, symbols, and so forth. Now let's see what happens. Let's talk about some things we can build into HTTPD that's not built there by default. Um, so hook tracing is something, um, I think this idea was first added to the open source HTTPD by um, Theo Schlossnagel, who had some D-trace enhancements for HTTPD. Um, and if you know what the hooks are, right, that's a pretty critical point of processing, right? So it used some metaprogramming to convert these uh, hook invocations into traceable probes. Um, now that code has kind of died. Uh, one thing we do have in 2.4 I'm gonna, let me just skip over some of these details, um, is, is a me another mechanism to, you know, write your own code that does something with these hook macros, right? Mod hook AR, where AR stands for active request, is just an example that uses that, right? And that's not, I mean, that's for my website. It's not in the, it's not an example module in the HTTPD source tree. But, you know, it shows how you, how you would build such a mess, how you build such a module, and you can do things with it like, uh, like here, this, uh, this uh, access log message. I've extended the access log to include the request failure note in the access log format, right? And uh, mod hook AR, you know, by watching what happened at every hook invocation, it said, okay, whoops, I got a bad error code, 404, and the name of the hook is the handler, and the module I just called into was mod CGID, right? So mod hook AR can do that. Uh, mod hook AR also implements an exception hook so that if the process crashes, it gets its code run. And it can use that same information that's been maintaining during the request to say, hey, um, at the time of the crash, we were inside the handler hook and the module, you know, it was mod crashes handler hook that we were in. So if you're interested in playing with it, something like that, right, you could download um, the source code and, and you know, there'll be instructions for how to build it into HTTPD and so forth. And um, I think, to me, this is a very interesting thing, but there are a lot of um, experiments that need to be done. And uh, for example, making the API easier to use where you can load in a module dynamically and maybe load that in there only when you're trying to diagnose a problem or switch between different diagnostic modules at different times based on what you're trying to um, diagnose. Okay, the D-trace probes, um, if you're interested in this, you probably should uh, post to dev at httpd.apache.org because the code is really not, hasn't been kept current. And uh, hopefully some of us would have time to help you figure out uh, what needs to be done next to get that ready. Um, exception hooks, these have been around for a while on the Unix side. Uh, basically, if, HT, if an HTTP child process crashes, it can call into, um, into loaded modules. And a couple that I've written are mod what killed us and mod backtrace. You know, mod backtrace, uh, if, if it knows how to deal with the system libraries, right, on that, on your platform, it can um, put a, a backtrace in the error log or in another file, depending on which version of the module you have. And mod what killed us will track what, you know, what was the original request line and the HTTP headers for that request that triggered the crash. Um, let's see. So mod what killed us, I mean, this looks funny that there's a backtrace there, but the latest versions of 
of Mod What Killed Us and Mod Backtrace rely on Mod What Killed Us to actually write the report. And uh, if Backtrace is available, then that will be included with the rest of it. And here's the part where um, you see the original request uh, data that triggered it. And uh, in the latest version of Mod What Killed Us, it can filter out uh, any kind of you know, request header that you don't want to see or query argument or anything like that to try to give the administrator a tool not to log the passwords or session data in this. Um, okay, what else? Uh, we're about to get, we're about to run out of time, but uh, one thing about these is they work pretty well on Windows, the latest versions of it. As long as you have the, the PDB files for the system libraries and the PDB files for the server, right? So at least in the past when Windows builds of HTBD were available from Apache.org, there was always a separate zip file with the debug symbols, right? So you download the zip file that matches your binaries, you unpack it from, you know, the install directory, and that allows, you know, I mean, traditionally it was Dr. Watson or WinDebug, something like that. But also, it allowed Mod Backtrace to get really good um, information for you. Um, 2.2 stuff, what the difference is. Um, I mean, everybody's using 2.4 anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So, so we're about to run out of time. I'm going to skip over that. 2.2 uh, not available. Um, I did play with some, some with Nginx. Um, you know, I don't have extensive experience there, right? So, you know, if I, if I find somebody that says something about it, well, as far as I know, that's right. And unless I can refute it with my own experiences, that's, that's what I believe. But, um, you know, I've used HTTPD for a very long time and Nginx I just play with from time to time. But I think one of the issues with um, comparing how we would uh, debug one server versus another is, um, you just have to kind of take a different approach to Nginx on some things, right? If you turn on, you know, you, you don't have such uh, wide control over what gets logged and even what gets logged for each line there. Um, and you have to build it set differently uh, with this debug option to even be able to get this you know, level of information. So unless you build Nginx with a debug, you probably don't want to really compare it with HTTPD. Right, because the debug is what is going to be required to figure out when things aren't going exactly as you expected. Um, and you know, it, it does have capabilities to log things like mod dump IO does, or or the um, higher levels of trace in the HTTPD module. But you know, you may have to use different techniques to filter those out or get timestamps, stuff like that. Um, it has a nice feature for um, specifying that you only want to do it for certain clients. You know, in 2.4, we use the expression capability and the, and the if to set up a, a different log level. This is, I mean, this is a more direct way to get there. Um, and as with HTBD, you know, someone also played with detracing, detrace probes inside Nginx. Now, uh, I mean, there is a benefit with Nginx uh, just with the generic dtrace stuff, right? Because the PID provider of dtrace is what provides a lot of kind of stuff you want to find out. And the PID provider, you know, you have to tell it the PID. And with Nginx, you don't have a boatload of HTTPD, you don't have a boatload of processes that you have to choose from or that you have to follow in, you know, the entire set of, right? So, so dtrace is a little bit easier with Nginx, even if you don't have the um, Nginx probes. Let's see, another thing, um, you know, if, if Nginx thread crashes or HTTPD thread crashes, it's probably about the same as far as trying to understand what the backtrace is. Um, now, if you're looking at idle threads in the server to see what they're doing, well, uh, you know, like the worker NPM in Apache or pre-fork, right, you're gonna see the whole call stack even for idle threads, whereas in Nginx, and to a very limited extent, the event NPM Right, you're going to have to pour through function, I'm sorry, uh, connection tables to know what they're doing, right? Which in turn means you have to have a, a different kind of build for Nginx in order to do that. So, um, yeah, here's some things I'll talk about during the talk. But uh, if we have any questions, uh, 
any particular topics you're more interested in, um, walk up to the mic and let's see what you got. Any questions? Okay, Daniel, thank you, sir. I, I do have a question. I don't, I don't often have to debug at this level, uh, but what's your opinion on combine, uh, compiling with full symbols in a production build? Well, I've because when the it. crashes do happen, it I've really sucks because I got no information. I've never shipped a product with uh, full symbols. Tend to be, I mean, in my just where I work, they tend to be, you know, moderately optimized, um, and we could debug problems. Um, okay, but you know, you didn't have every tool at your uh, disposal. Sure. And of course, you know, reproduce whether whether it's the want the desire for symbols or not, right? It, a lot of times, you spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to reproduce the problem once you know sort of what codes it's in, and if you can reproduce it, then you own it, and you can run it on your own build. Have you ever had the uh, mispleasure of debugging uh, OpenSSL problems in Apache? Um, no. no. It, it turns out that um, while, um, you know, at IBM and Oracle, where I spent a lot of time working on their products, each of those had a proprietary SSL right. So, you know, OpenSSL, no. Um, did I know a little bit about their, their library? Sure. And did I know who, <laughs> who owned, owned it? You know, it was never something I had sourced to anyway. So there's kind sure. of limited ability there, unlike with OpenSSL. Thanks. Sure. OK. Well, um, if you want to get the slides, go there. And if you take off all that stuff after the first slash, uh, you can probably figure out how to contact me if you want to ask other questions or, you know, see if there's a, any joint interest in, say, expanding those annotations or anything else. Thanks. Thank